Welcome everyone. Recording lessons from home with Mac or iPad is a great option for creating that content while teaching remotely. I wanna show you today just a few of the options that may be available to you. Um, I know that I'm not gonna cover everything and I'm not gonna go too in depth with any, any one. So I encourage you to listen, um, just get a sense of what's possible, what's available, and then choose what's best for you to follow up with me later on and go deeper in using it to actually create that content to send home to students. We're gonna cover a few tools, um, starting with some built-in tools on your Mac laptop. Um, and then we're gonna talk about some options for if you are an iPhone user for a personal iPhone, or if you happen to have an iPad as well. Um, and then we're gonna spend some time talking about digitizing documents, how to send home digital copies of paper resources for students, talk about sharing recommendations and best practices. We do have time um, for question and answer at the end, but for the purposes of this recording, we'll just try to focus on that content so that you can watch and rewatch this recording. You can rewind it, fast forward, and try some of the things out that you choose to be important for you later on. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And just so you know, everyone, there is a uh, link to a digital handout with some hyperlinked content with additional information. If you go to bit.ly slash clrecordlessons, that should take you to this document. And this is a great place to um, use as a reference for later on as well. Um, this is our document and this is our agenda. So if we were in a live Zoom right now, I would make sure that you are, are comfortable with muting and unmuting yourself, starting and stopping your personal video to save on bandwidth, um, how to access the chat to both um, receive and send questions and answers and so that you know that this is being recorded. But this is just a recording with me myself in Zoom right now. So we're gonna go right away into using a built-in tool on the Mac, which is QuickTime. Now, QuickTime just comes with the operating system. So you don't have to go out and find or install any kind of application. You can just go to your Spotlight search in the top right-hand part of your Mac home screen and type in QuickTime. It's gonna look for QuickTime Player. It shows us here that icon of that Q with the blue inside of it, that's indeed QuickTime Player. And when you click on it, it starts it, it launches it. And we know now that it's the active application because in the top left hand part of my screen here, it says QuickTime Player. I also see it running down in my dock and just a hint or a tip for Mac users, I would recommend, and this is what I've done on my machine, clicking control click on that icon and going to options and saying keep in dock. There we go. So with that, um, I can now access it anytime in my dock using the QuickTime icon and it again launches it so that it becomes the active application and other than that I don't see a lot on my screen but I do now have the ability to click on file and start a new movie recording. I can just pull that up and now I have a camera and I can see the audio is picking up my voice down here and I can click the record button and it just records me just like a video camera. I can hit stop and I now have a file that I can go save and put somewhere on my computer and name it and keep it or send it out to my students. I'm gonna click the red X and not save this particular recording, but it's as easy as doing that. And some people ask, why would I do that? Well, you don't have to use it, but it's just there. It's an easier way. It's a trimmed down version. You don't have to go into iMovie and learn advanced controls. You don't have to find a way to prop up your phone. It's just already your camera's facing you. Um, your laptop is your stabilizer and it's just your tripod. To, so you can just record a quick message. Um, hit file save. One thing that I will remind or um, recommend for all of these QuickTime recordings is that you export them as the lowest quality um, possible, just to compress it and make that file size smaller. Because just because we recorded it doesn't mean we don't have to then upload it somewhere and get it to our students. And with our home internet and our limits on bandwidth, um, a smaller file size will be easier to work with. So I'll remind you that of again in a second. Another way to save on bandwidth is just do a audio recording instead of the video. 
file new audio recording. This is a great thing to start with. It just gives you just an audio recorder. So you can click that, that record button and just talk and just give an instructional message or um, just you know checking in with your students, but it's just your voice. When you hit stop, you now have this untitled file. It's 10 seconds long and you can go file, save and name it and save it somewhere and then send it out to other people to hit play and just listen to you. And that's a lot smaller file size. The third option for using QuickTime is to do a screen recording. So file, new screen recording from the QuickTime menu lets you record your whole computer screen, whatever's up on it. So if you have um, a web app or um, a website like showing students around or showing them um, an informational article you want them to read, whatever it might be on your screen, you wanna record it along with your voice like I am now. So you get this toolbar to record with QuickTime and we are in the record the entire screen setting. You could also switch it to a selected portion and you could just drag your a mouse around part of your screen. Before you click the record though, it's really important in QuickTime that you check your options and make sure that the microphone is on because the default is none. It's just the screen, but not your voice. So you wanna turn that on um, using the built-in or whatever device you want to capture your, your voice. And also I recommend that you click the option to show mouse clicks. So when you're moving your mouse around on the recording, um, the people that are viewing your video will actually see it and not just have to listen to what they click here and they don't know where here is. So turn those two settings on or options on and then they'll be on every time you use QuickTime to do a screen recording. So now it's ready for you just to click that record button and it's recording. So I can move my web page around, I can navigate to something else on my machine and it's recording my voice as well as whatever people see on my computer screen. Now to stop this recording, you'll look at the top of your screen for a little stop button. It's black right now, but my mouse is spinning around it and I'll click that and it'll pull up my recording as a finished video. I can click play and you know and watch it here. There we go. It's actually playing the audio back in my headphones. Here, I'm gonna show you that it moves around here. Yeah, so you can see my mouse moving around. All right, um, remember we go file save and we name it and place it somewhere. But also before you do that, you might do export as and choose that lower quality um, file size and then export it to your desktop as a smaller size. That's going to be easier to work with. I'm gonna get out of this, cancel this file, and hopefully that gets you started with what's possible with QuickTime. So this is how to use a Keynote file in the built-in Keynote app on your Mac and record your voice along with it as you're um, recording to share with students. You can see here I've opened up a ready-made PowerPoint file that came with the textbook. It's a science piece of content. I'm gonna go to Play, Record Slideshow. What this does, it takes you into like a presenter mode. And now I can, I can see my audio. It's picking it up with a microphone down here in the bottom corner. And I can click that record button and it counts down for me, three, two, one. And now it's using my voice and the slides. I'm just using my arrows to go through them like a teacher would, like I am on my smart board in my classroom. It's recording my voice and my slides. You can even, you know, do some marking on top of them if you, if you want to. And then I'll hit that stop button and get out of this presenter mode. There we go. And now what happens is Keynote actually saves on each of these slides little audio files that go with them. So if you as a teacher go to file and export to, you can make it a movie file. And this is one recording of all your slides and all your talking. I would change that file size to a smaller resolution and then hit next and save it somewhere on your machine where you have control of it's now a movie file. So when you send it out to your students, all they have to do is, is click play and watch it back or put it on wherever you're gonna share it with them, okay? So how to get a, um, a PowerPoint into Keynote? Um, you would just go to your finder, wherever your files are. I'm just gonna search for a PowerPoint that already is on my machine. 
And here is a PowerPoint file .pptx. I'm going to, instead of double clicking on it to open it up, I'm going to control click and choose open with. And then I have that option to convert it into a keynote file instead of the default of opening it up with PowerPoint. And that again is so that I can go to that play menu and record slideshow and add my voice on top of it. So um, some great options there. If you don't already have PowerPoint slides built for you, just go to Keynote and start a new blank presentation. And then you can type some text on your screen and you can add pictures. And if you don't wanna show your face, you can just record that through that play record slideshow menu and then export as a movie. Okay, real simple. Now people have asked me, how do I get my picture to show like a picture in picture so my students can see my slides and hear me teaching but they can also see my face in the corner and um, some teachers have come up with some great ways of doing that like opening up photo booth and kind of resizing your windows so you have um, the people can see both when you're recording with QuickTime um, that's a great option but you might also consider just using zoom now, Zoom is going to be our next option for recording lessons from home. And I'm going to take you back to our welcome screen here. Um, I want you to imagine that you're in a Zoom room, in your own Zoom room, just like I am now, but you're in yours. And nobody's in it. You're just in it with yourself. <laughs> and you turn on your video like I did here so that you can, you know, see your face and the students will be able to see it. And then you click record down here in your uh, menu bar, you're just gonna basically record yourself in your own Zoom meeting. Um, then you're gonna go to the share button that I have the red arrow pointing to on the screenshot. And when you click that, it'll bring up this menu and you would probably most of the time just click desktop one. That's what I've done for you. So you see, Everything on my computer desktop, everything that I do and, and show on my computer screen, but you're also seeing that video of me in that inset window. And because I clicked record before I began, I can just go ahead and teach this lesson that way. Um, I then hit that stop record whenever I'm done. And my um, video file from Zoom is automatically saved in my documents, part of my Mac, in a folder that Zoom made called Zoom. You can see if I expand this folder, here's all the recordings that I've done in Zoom the last few days. They're date and time stamped automatically. And I can go into one of those folders. And you can see here where a couple of times I tried doing a um, recording. This is how it'll look after you first go visit that folder. You'll have to double click to convert it. And it'll ask you, where do you want it? That's fine. I'll hit save. Okay, here it is up here at the top. Um, it like it fixed it. It it be, basically got it ready so that other people could watch it as a video. And this is the folder now. It has um, the playback M3U. We don't care about that. The audio only file of my recording. And then this is the video file. It's Zoom underscore zero for some reason. I can rename that. It's 29 kilobytes. Um, nothing big here, but this wasn't a long one. Um, just to remind you, we talked about QuickTime earlier. I could do a control click and I could open this video file with QuickTime Player, right? I could open it up here. I don't know what's in this recording. There we go. It's just a quick test. But the reason why I might do that, by the way, I could just share this video file like it is now, okay? But I might open it with QuickTime to do that file export as and compress it to a smaller file size and quality. Play around with that because if if you try to upload something and it's going to take hours and hours and hours, then this would be beneficial. But if you don't need to export it as 480p, you'll have a better quality recording if you don't. I just wanted to show everybody that that's possible because um, we've been running into those issues with our home internet and it might be beneficial for you to know how to make it a smaller file um, to work with as well. So Zoom recordings, even if students aren't in your Zoom room live, you can still use that as your own recording space and make those recordings that way. While we're on the topic of Zoom, um, whether you're live, so you're recording something or you have students in there live, the other way of sharing your content on your Zoom meeting 
is this third one that we see here. It's iPhone or iPad via AirPlay. And if you were to um, choose that option after you click share, then your screen would look like this. Um, you would be able to make sure that both devices are on the same network. And then on your iPad or your iPhone, you would go to the AirPlay, like pull down and get your command center and go to screen mirroring. And there would be an option that says Zoom dash whatever the name of your Zoom account is. And then you just mirror to that. And so then in your Zoom meeting, in your room, in the, in the content that you're sharing on your screen, um, you would see anything that you see on your iPad as opposed to your computer desktop. So that's a really great option too, especially if you're already comfortable teaching and manipulating an app on your iPad or your iPhone, you may as well record that screen and then use your picture-in-picture -picture video within Zoom. So I'm gonna stop my screen share now and I'm gonna actually take you back to a video here. Whoops, there we go. And so you can see me and, and you can see um, my office here. I was wanting to encourage everyone to start super simple, okay? So like if all of this already sounds too overwhelming or too techy, using Zoom, using QuickTime, using Keynote and exporting and things like that, um, don't, don't worry. You can just start with your phone, right? And just record a video of yourself. I'm gonna open up my phone here and go to the video camera and flip that phone around so that now it's recording front facing to record a video of myself. Um, Molly has this genius um, tool she found at Menards. I always call it a chip clip, but she assures me that it really is an iPhone stand. So you can just point your, your camera at yourself there and just sit back in your chair and just talk into your phone and teach a lesson or um, go ahead and you know pull up a, an easel with a whiteboard on it and just pretend like you're teaching in your classroom and, and record that way. Or if you don't have a holder, you might use your um, a homemade do-it-yourself document camera that I've kind of built here out of an ice cream bucket. And then I just found a piece of wood so that my phone can hang out over the edge. Now, instead of using the front facing camera here, I would just use the regular video camera, make sure it's hanging off the edge. And then whatever is showing underneath of my, um, my phone screen there, underneath of my do it your if that makes sense. So if you just have something that sets, you know, sets your uh, little stand, it doesn't have to be an ice cream bucket, it could be a, a box or anything that lifts it up a little bit, and then something to make a ledge. I just use these books to, to weigh down the um, or to keep it balanced so that the phone doesn't tumble off and then it's hanging out over the edge so I can do my workbook and just right here and it's just filming my hands and, and my voice with the camera. Another option is over here. Um, this was something that was just released not too long ago at all. Um, it's using an Osmo which a lot of elementary teachers already have and the Osmo kits that came with them but um, it really just only utilizes, in this case, the base. So this base that comes with it that holds the iPad. And then this camera, this mirror that goes over the iPad camera. And then one more thing you need is a free app from Osmo called Osmo Projector. And you can see I have it loaded right here. What this does is it turns this mirror that goes up here on your camera into a reflector so that you can use it as a document camera. So I can go to start here, and now you can see how nice and clear that looks um, on my iPad screen. It's not filming me necessarily, but it is filming um, whatever I do on the paper, and I could be talking and writing at the same time. Now my camera isn't super clear for you, but if you recorded just your iPad screen here, it would indeed be really clear and crystal, and you wouldn't have to, to worry about using a third-party app necessarily, if you're just recording your iPad screen. All right, you can also record your iPad screen. And to do that, you just wanna to go to your settings and set up in the control center. So right underneath general here is control center. And then come over into the control center settings and customize controls. Now, the very first time you come here, 
the screen recording won't be up in the top section. It'll be down here under more controls. So you'll just tap the plus next to it and it sends it up to the top like it was for mine. Now it will always be available in your control center and you won't have to come back to settings anymore. So now when I pull down on my control center, which is pulling down from the top right corner of your iPad or iPhone screen, like right where the battery and the, the um, Wi-Fi is, then you'll see this record button. And if you press and hold, whoops, sorry, press and hold, do a long press on that circle, that um, record button, you would turn on your microphone first to make sure it's capturing your audio, and then you just tap it and record, okay? It'll count down for you three, two, one, and then whatever you do on your app, Whatever you pull up in your, your notes app or using explain everything or any kind of an app that you would normally use on the iPad, it's just recording your screen and your voice. It's like QuickTime recorder on the Mac. It's the built-in screen recorder on the iPad. And you'll just go find your stop button. Then on the top of your menu bar, up again where your um, the, the battery symbol is, you'll hit the stop and it'll go straight to your camera roll. It'll be a recording in your photos um, when you're done. So if you turn it on in settings first, then you can access it with the control center and you can record your screen as another option for recording content and lessons from home. So if you have an Osmo, check out the Osmo projector app and um, just teach on paper. That's fine too, but make a video so that you can add your own personal voice to it and give additional instruction. So I've recommended a couple of third-party apps um, here in section seven of my agenda here. Um, they aren't built-in apps, but because of the time that we're in right now, they have offers for free pro, pro versions. If you ever have used Explain Everything or EduCreations in the past, this is a really great opportunity to simply teach on your iPad screen and not have to record it with something else, um, but just use the features within Explain Everything or EduCreations, or even Seesaw to do so. However, if you've never used these apps before, you don't need to go out and learn them. But I did link to these three some additional um, features and resources to use them if you would like to create content that way within the app. Know if you do use Seesaw to record your lessons right within app. Um, you can do videos, just talk to your students, and you can you know, mark up documents and things like that. But there is a five minute limit um, to record it within Seesaw. Um, that's not to say that you can't record somewhere else and then send people a link through Seesaw. You can do that all you want, doesn't have a limit there. But if you're gonna record right within Seesaw, there's that five minute limit on video files and, and a, a megabyte limit too. Um, but those are some options. Again, just see what, works for you and choose that that way to create your lessons and record them for your students that works best for you and for them. Let's talk now about digitizing documents because sometimes it, a video isn't necessary. Maybe we just want to get them um, access to a document, a workbook page, um, a text-based article, pages out of um, a magazine, whatever it might be. And so we know we can take pictures of them. <coughs> But I'm going to recommend that if you have an iOS device, if you have an iPhone or an iPad, that you actually use the built-in scanner in the Notes app, and you'll get a better quality, easier PDF to share with students that way. So I want to demonstrate that now. And to do that, I'm going to share my screen again. But I'm going to use that option I already talked about earlier, that is um, recording my, or using AirPlay to connect to my phone and my iPad. So you're not seeing this right now, but I am going to the screen mirroring settings on my phone and going to Zoom. So now on your screen, you see my phone actually um, instead of my computer screen. And if I go home, you'll see there's my home screen, et cetera, okay? So you're seeing my phone through Zoom. Now I wanna show you how to digitize documents using the built-in scanner. So here on my notes app, if I do a long press, I get these options. You do need to make sure that your iOS is updated. This is a newer feature. So if you do a long press, a hard press on the notes app and you don't see scan document, you want to update your phone. But here you'll see it. And so I can just tap scan document. And then I can take my, my physical document 
up. Oh, it seems a little delayed. There, we're going to be patient. Went to notes. There we go. There's my workbook. And it's just like I'm taking a picture. You'll see how the whole page kind of turns yellow. And I just capture it, hit the button like I'm taking a picture of it. Now, this one I have to adjust. It didn't automatically grab the edges of the pages. So I'm dragging those four little dots to tell it where the edges of the pages are. And then I tap keep scan in the bottom right. And it already goes and it gets me ready for the next page. I'm gonna flip the page, position it in my viewer, hit that scan button or that capture button like I'm taking a picture. And this time it was a lot smarter and it found those four corners. So I don't even need to adjust them. I just click, click keep scan. And then it gets me ready to do another one, ready for next scan. I hit the button. This one I got to adjust. I'm not doing it as, as easily or as uh, <laughs> swiftly as I have in the past. I'm going to click keep scan. But I have now captured three separate workbook pages. So you'll see on the bottom left of my iPhone screen here, if I tap on that, it brings up the three pages that I've just scanned. Um, nice and clean and um, pretty bright. It brightens them up automatically too. You'll notice too that it's ready for me to use the, the, the share arrow. There's a save button, sorry, in the bottom right. Then it brings up the three pages. I can flip through them there. And the share arrows on the top right. And now I can send it out just like I would any file on my phone through AirDrop, through email, through messages. Um, I can, you know, put it into Google Drive, save it to files. I could send it to Seesaw. Whatever I normally would do with a PDF, it's ready for me. It's also automatically named. You can see at the top there, it scanned the content of those pages. It must have been about solving. And it gave me a file name, a PDF name. It's one document. I don't have to merge all of the, the pictures that I took and convert them to a PDF. It's ready for me to go. We'll talk more about how to, to edit that, how students can mark up the PDF or put their answers, type their answers on a PDF when we talk in the future, um, especially with utilizing some Google tools to be able to make this more editable or annotate on top of it. Um, but for now, I just wanted to show you, it's, it's a lot cleaner to capture a document um, as a PDF using that built-in scanner as opposed to um, going out and taking pictures or even trying to scan it with a document camera and, and snap images there. Because our phone cameras are so much better these days than, um, than our, uh, any other cameras. They're just a lot higher quality. Another thing that we can do, and I'm going to show you this one on my computer instead of my, um, my phone screen. We can do it either way, but I'm going to share my computer screen again, and I'm going to take you to Safari. And in Safari, there is um, a couple of features that you would want to know how to utilize to digitize documents. So this is a Time for Kids article about the coronavirus and using video streaming in it. If I wanted to send that out to students for whatever purposes, um, the first thing that I would recommend you do is you click up here on the top of your URL bar, you see those little horizontal lines, and that switches your article into reader view. See how it eliminates all the ads and distractions? Well, most of them anyway. And it just keeps the important content and the text. Um, that's really great to do before you make it a PDF. So it's a lot cleaner and less paper if you would have to print it out. And you can do that on the phone and the iPad as well. Just look for the reader view icon. It might have an AA instead of the horizontal lines, but it's in the same place in Safari on your iPhone or iPad. Um, even if you don't do that, even if you don't do reader view, we can now go and export this or save it as a PDF. So the easiest way to make it a PDF is just perhaps to go file and export as PDF. Now it's gonna take that cleaned up reader view of this article and make it into a PDF that I save on my desktop and then share, okay? Back to our, um, our phone sharing. So this is a really great feature of Safari on the iPhone or the iPad with the updated iOS. Um, we can go to an article online 
Again, reader view or not reader view, doesn't matter. There we go, there's reader view now on my article. Here, see how it really cleans it up and it just focuses on the text. Um, I'll go ahead and, and take it out of reader view. But like we would in the past take a screenshot, we just do it the same. We press and hold both buttons. It captures it, it makes a screenshot. Then if I tap on the little icon or the thumbnail image of that screenshot, it pulls it up into this new viewer where you'll see across the top, I have screen is the default, but over to the right there, it says full page. I'm gonna tap on that because in the past when we took a screenshot, it just gave us the first screen, whatever we saw on the first screen. And now when we go full page, it actually takes all the scrollable content. It's taking a little bit here to process and it puts it into one screenshot so that you can save it as a PDF. You can actually mark it up too. You can see across the bottom, there are the annotation tools. So I could highlight, draw some arrows on this PDF before I send it out to students. But in a second here, when it finishes processing, um, normally it doesn't take that long either, but I have my share arrow top right on this case. There we go. And I now have it as a PDF to send out. So it just automatically is a PDF. As a matter of fact, if I hit done here, my options are save as PDF, save this as a PDF to my files or delete it. So it's just, it knows that you want to turn it into a PDF basically if you do that um, full page screenshot. Whether you mark it up or not, um, just take the screenshot, tap on the, the thumbnail, and then tap on full page, and then you've got it um, ready to send out as a PDF. I hope that made sense. Um, I really like to use that feature instead of in the past, we had to do a lot of screenshotting and piecing together on an iOS device. Remember on a Mac, we just went file and export as PDF. So that's nice too. So definitely more options than just taking pictures to scan things. Um, look into those and again, ask us later on if you have additional questions that weren't covered in this recording. So we're gonna switch now into some sharing recommendations. Um, this is really important. We could have started with this, but I'm going to reiterate it now um, that we know that teaching these lessons and recording these lessons from home, it's a multi-step process. It is not as simple as just making the video. As a matter of fact, after we've made the video, however we made it with everything we've talked about so far or made the PDF, we still have to do two more things. We've got to put that file somewhere. We've got to upload it to some web space, and then we gotta tell people how to get to it, share the link. So we have some options on the left here of my handout um, of places that you could upload your recording to, your digital content. YouTube is my first recommendation. Anyone with a school Google account already has a YouTube channel. All you do is go to youtube.com, you sign into your school Google account, and then you find in the top right hand corner the place to upload a video. You can upload a video and then you choose after it's done processing if you want that video to be public, unlisted, or private. And I've gotten a lot of questions in the last few days from teachers who thought that their videos were private. So, hold on here. Know that private means private. Like it means nobody else can view it. That's only just for you. So it's just like private hidden storage. You would want to instead, if you don't want it to be public and open to everybody, you would choose unlisted. And unlisted means that um, people can't randomly come across it in YouTube, but anyone who has the link can view it. So if you send out the link to an unlisted video, people can click on it and watch it, but people aren't gonna just search for it and find it in YouTube. So that's available to anybody. Now I know especially elementary teachers might be hesitant to put their content on YouTube because of the fact that after students have finished watching your YouTube video, YouTube might suggest other content that maybe isn't appropriate. So if that's the case, or in order to be more, more private than YouTube, even if it's unlisted on YouTube, um, you might consider uploading to Google Drive instead. Um, this is just your drive. So you go to drive and you upload a file and you put your, your video in there. Know though that just because you put it in Google Drive doesn't mean other people can see it. You have to find the share options and change it so that anyone who has the link 
can um, actually see that content or view it. Again, we'll help you with these things if they're the route you choose, but just because you recorded the video, we still have to find a place to store that video online in the cloud. If you have access to Canvas, like a lot of our ESU8 teachers do at the high school level, you can go to a Canvas post, a page, an assignment, whatever it might be, and you can upload or attach a video file to that as well. Um, you can also record right into Canvas using your webcam, which actually takes us to another option for this first part that we talked about. Um, uh, just know if you do that, like if you go to a, a page or a post and you click insert video and record video with your webcam, um, there's not really a, a storage limit or a time limit, but it will take a long time. When you hit stop, take a long time to upload and process. And Canvas doesn't really let you know that it's doing that. So just be patient and trust it. Try it with a short video first. Um, and then it will show up as inline or embedded media in the post, which means kids don't have to go out to YouTube to watch your video. It's just right there in Canvas, which is really nice. You could also upload to Dropbox. Dropbox, that's another third party um, cloud storage app that a lot of people use. That's that first part, uploading it, getting it somewhere online. Then we've got to take that link and share it with our students. So Seesaw, definitely, if you've got Seesaw in place, definitely a recommended tool, especially for elementary age. Um, you can send out that link as a parent announcement or put it right into your class feed and have students access it that way. You could also put your link on Google Classroom. You can even attach a video file right to Google Classroom. And basically the difference there is if you go to a Google Classroom assignment and you attach a file instead of a link, it'll actually upload your um, video to your Google Drive, change the sharing settings for you, and then keep track of who, you know, for you as an assignment. So it, it streamlines that process and you don't, you can do fewer clicks um, if you use Google Classroom already. Canvas, again, we talked about that and that's a great communication channel to send out these links and ways to access the, the teaching um, resources you create for your students or it could just be email, or it could just be text messages, service like Remind that sends notifications to phones as to where to go to get to the content you created. So uh, uh, again, you're not trying to be an expert in all of these, but you're choosing carefully one way to record yourself teaching, um, and then where to store it online, and then how to get that message out to your students of how to access it. I save the best for last because no matter what tools you choose, it is really important just to keep these four simple principles in mind. Whatever you do in your instructional materials, your enrichment, your review videos you make, keep it short. Take whatever you would normally do in the classroom and cut it down at least by a third, um, to a third, cut, down two, cut out two thirds of it. Um, keep it really simple, decide the most important content don't try to teach everything you would teach in the classroom. Um, it wouldn't be a good idea for you to lecture for 45 minutes in the classroom either. We definitely don't wanna have a 45 minute video that students have to watch. We'll lose them on that. So just pick out a couple of key concepts, maybe just teach one important skill at a time, um, or maybe even just communicate a message and, and leave um, some of the other details into the text part of the worksheet or the post that you send out so that your video is really short and really simple and really focused. Do make it personal though. There's so much educational content available online right now. Uh, we've got Khan Academy videos. We've got all kinds of places where the content's already created. The videos are already created. Our students don't need more of that. What they need is you. So put yourself in it. Um, make it um, specific to your classroom, to your students, to what they know from you already as their teacher um, and don't try to make it perfect. Um, it's, it's really hard to let go of that fear of looking on, being on camera and making mistakes. We all go through that, but now is not the time to have those fears. We've all got to set that aside and be happy with the first take, show our students our imperfections um, and that's okay. That's actually a great way to show your authentic self and encourage students to be willing to take some risks too. So keep it short, keep it simple, 
make it personal and don't make it perfect. And that's my advice to you, no matter which of these tools you try and which of those ways you um, record your content from home and share it with remote teaching. Now, before I close out this recording, this video, I'd like to show your attention or turn your attention to the very last page. This is some bonus information that Apple Education has shared the last few days, starting with a web page where they, have, they are collecting resources specific from Apple Education. Um, for example, how to, to use the iPad to do a screen recording, oh, which I haven't shown. So I need to definitely show you that. Or um, scan documents, for example. They'll do a better job of teaching that. And right now there's only a couple of videos. So there's um, this one and there's one about creating and sharing presentations and demos, but coming soon there will be more. For example, how to create an engaging video with the Clips app, a really fun app if, if you've ever tried it before, or if you just wanna try something new to try to um, relate to your students, um, just use that free iOS app and record yourself in Clips and then send it out. So anyway, bookmark this site and try it out. So thank you a million for joining in, tuning into this recording. I hope you got some ideas. I'm sure more information will evolve as you guys share it with me about what works for you. Don't hesitate to reach out to us at ESU8 at any time with any question, big or small. We're here to help you. Um, and we're glad to partner with you to help you reach your students, no matter where they are and no matter where you are. Um, good luck and take care and stay safe.